Last week, you heard me begin the story of Jacob's 11th son, Joseph. As I said, his story may, takes up most of the last 12 chapters of Genesis, about one quarter of the whole book of Genesis. And we find out how God takes his first, the, this first son of Jacob and his beloved Rachel, who is the 11th son of Jacob, and brings him from a place of prideful prominence in his family down to the depths of slavery and up to the management of a state official's household and down to the depths of wrongful imprisonment and up to the management of the stores of wheat in Egypt and finally his role to make Pharaoh the richest ruler of the ancient world. And in all of this, he wrestles, he resettles his family to Egypt, which was far from the promised land where they all would eventually end up as slaves following the generations until our next, in, in the following generations until our next unusual character, Moses, is used by God to bring them out. So um, in all of this, as we move on to the second message of Joseph, we pick up where we left him last week, paying the penalties of too much pride, which nearly got him murdered, but did instead get him sold into slavery. This is where we find Joseph now in chains, or at least bound, and being led off to a life of slavery in Egypt as his distant and strange cousins descended from Ishmael, the disowned first son of Abram by his wife's servant, Havgar the Egyptian, uh, have purchased him and brought him now to Egypt. What is going on in this story of Joseph is this. God sometimes needs to clarify the character of his people so they know who they are supposed to be, how they are supposed to behave, and what, how they are supposed to be used. Now, in Genesis 37, we found Joseph as a 17-year-old overseer of his elder brothers in the care of Jacob's herds. Jacob is also called by his name Israel, depending on which of the two streams of the story are used. There's hints to us that, that the patriarch's uh, records have been combined into one record from two separate sources, and one prefers Jacob's birth name, and the other prefers the significance of the renaming of Jacob as Israel. In the same way, in the story uh, we read today, there's two streams of the story that have been combined, but this time it's evident by one's use of the Lord's proper name, Yahweh, the other's use of the more generic word for God, as we use it in English. In Hebrew, the word for God is simply El. Anyway, that's a very brief description of how the scholars apply a practice of textual criticism um, to help their studies of the origins of the original records before they were collected as we have them now. At any rate, Joseph, now the 17th, 17 year old son of Rachel, as we shared last week, had his pride problem that nearly got him murdered. He did get him bound for Egypt to Egypt as a slave of whomever would pay the higher, highest price. And just think of from where he came, from the most favored position in his father's household, wearing the fancy coat that was a sign of some authority. Jacob was stripped of his robe and, and his role, thrown into a water pit in the pastures, a week's walk north of where his, father's were, where his father was, and then left to die if God allowed it. His father was shown his torn and bloodied robe and thought he was dead, ripped away from his father's favor and love. Joseph began to understand somewhere along the caravan trails to Egypt that there would be no rescue mission. He came from a place of pride to a place of dishonor, a place of importance to a place of servitude, a place of personal independence to a place of complete, complete dependence upon the protection of God and the mercy of God others. God has some work to do in the character of Joseph so that his character uh, would be formed into the kind of character that God wanted to use. And for Joseph, this would be a harder path than his father's voluntary indenture to win Rachel as his bride. And so let's, we'll take a look at how that goes. Now, of course, we know that Jacob, Joseph had his 
dreams. Joseph had his dreams. As a young man, uh, those dreams clearly pointed to his future role in the story of God's people, but I'm sure he never thought of it being in Egypt when he dreamed those dreams. I wonder how much he talked with God about his dreams as he trudged along. The dream of the sheaves that he first shared with his brothers that made them hate him even more was a kind of vision of their journey to buy grain. Then there was the dream of the sun, moon, and stars, all bound down to Joseph, who would be realized, which would be realized in part when the extended famine led to his whole family and their wealth being imported into Egypt under Joseph's arrangements with Pharaoh. But Joseph had no idea that his dreams would work out this way right now. Stripped of his robes, stripped of his father's favor, stripped of his hopes, and stripped of his freedom, we can see from our reading of scripture that these terrible events came about because Joseph had too much pride and not enough wisdom to keep these dreams of dominance to himself. Instead, sharing them with all the headstrong pride of a 17-year-old overseer of his brother's work who thought the world he lived in was his oyster. Most of his brothers plotted to murder him, but Reuben intervened. At first left alone in that pit, no hope of escape. His immediate answer to his prayers to get out of the situation would not work out as a 17-year-old might have thought. He wasn't removed and restored to a place where he could demand justice from his murderous siblings. Not at all. The record in Genesis instead tells us that Joseph was sold into slavery as revenge from his older half-brothers on the sudden inside of Judah when the caravan of Ishmaelites and the traders of Midian just happened to show up at lunchtime by God's grace, really. He was priced at 20 pieces of silver, a couple of coins for each of the boys to bribe them all into silence as the youngest brother, Benjamin, was probably told that they could do this to him even more easily than they did it to Joseph. But at least Joseph's life was preserved because Joseph had talents that God wanted to use. And this is where the story reminds us that the talents and skills that we each have are not strictly our own, however hard we have worked to hone and develop them. Every talent we have is a gift from God. Every strength we have is a design from God. And every skill we have is a tool that God wants to use for his own purposes. Now, I really don't think this became clear to Joseph for a number of years after his enslavement. I think that his first success in the house of Potiphar might have come from a young man's own imaginations of his self-importance. It takes us a while, each of us, to learn how to be useful for God and humble before him. Yet, through all that was about to happen many years later, Joseph would save his family and Egypt from starvation. But first, God needed to train Joseph's character. And God doesn't waste the situation of Joseph in the coming years, just like he doesn't waste whatever it is we have gone through. It seems that in the long journey as a slave for sale to the highest bidder, that Joseph began to learn the lessons of relying on the God of his fathers for hope and for safety. He, the forced humility of slavery was part of God's way of training Joseph's character to serve others as he served God. And so from this point in Joseph's story, God became, becomes much more important in his life than God was before. But first, of course, he became a slave. And, and uh, we're sharing this story from Genesis chapters 39 and 40. And there's, uh, there's a rather unfortunate story of his older brother Judah's misadventures with his daughter-in-law in chapter 38 that we've set aside. It's not important to us at this point. So picking up the story again from the last verse of chapter 37, we read in the first verse of chapter 39, now Joseph had been taken to Egypt, an Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. We don't know much about Potiphar except for these records that surround Joseph's story, just that he was an officer in Pharaoh's army, here listed as a captain of the guards, 
which would have put him in a role of some importance in the protection of the king of Egypt. Now, the good news for Potiphar is that his purchase turned out to be a wise investment. For what Joseph did, God prospered, which places Joseph in the house of his master instead of in the fields or the brickyards. And as we read in Genesis 39, 2 and 3, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful. Well, that's really good news for Joseph at this point. His, from his position of slave, Yahweh God's activity in Joseph's life turned him into a success for his master's service. And we read through this in just a couple of Bible verses. But remember, this kind of change in situation and position does not happen overnight. In fact, first, we see that Joseph had to learn the language. And then he had to see the way things worked on his master's estate. And remember that Joseph's father was a nomadic shepherd that lived most of his life in a tent. And Joseph had to learn what it was like to manage a more settled brick house society in Egypt. He had to make his offers to serve in the next step up and then prove himself able and do this again and again and again until finally he got into his master's household through the slave's entrance. Then he had to keep at his tasks, working as a slave, not a superior, long enough for his master to see that Joseph's work was what was prospering him until finally he became a trustworthy man who blessed his master, which was happening because God was with him. Joseph's work and skills and talents made him valuable to Potiphar. And so we read in verses four and five that Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority from the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph and the Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. So partly our story shows a bit of bigotry, by the way, as the Hebrew takes control of the affairs of the Egyptian. That happens in the Old Testament, showing that God's people are best. And you would sort of expect that along the line, but it uh, is somewhat to the detriment of those around them. Joseph may be the newcomer, but he's the one who rises above all the others including all that Egypt had to offer to manage his master's household. And not only was Joseph a shining example of Hebrew skills, he was also a prime example of Hebrew strength, which is what allowed him to take control of his own situation. Working now as a servant, more than a slave, trusted in his master's household, manager of all that he saw, and maybe the best looking guy in the house of Potiphar as well, for Genesis records that this prime example of Hebrew strength, according to Genesis 39.6, caused a little trouble for him as he moved on, as we move on into the story. Um, Potiphar had left all that he owned under Joseph of Joseph's authority, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate, and, and then this line that moves into the next phase of Joseph's challenges here. Joseph was well-built and handsome. Now, you think that that would be a good thing, but every now and then, what is a good thing turns out to be a challenge, because the trouble now really begins. For Joseph, compared to all the other purchased slaves, especially those who were not Egyptian, he had a relatively cushy job for a slave as a state manager serving inside his master's house. And inside his master's house, God was teaching Joseph to put to use his greatest talents for the good of others. 
But while Joseph's job was cushy, the master's wife had the hots for Joseph. That became a lot of trouble because he was such a good looking guy. Of course, the Hebrew has to look better than all the Egyptians, right? That's part of the, that's part of the preference for God's people that shows up in the book of Genesis, just like uh, Sarah uh, in her later years caught the eyes of um, the Pharaoh and, or, and the other kings that Abram went around to see from time to time. Well, the master's wife just couldn't stop thinking about Joseph. Every day she would pass by and see him at work, observing him from every angle. And obviously, and finally, in Genesis 37, 39, verse 7, after some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, this version is pretty plain, sleep with me. Well, that was a little more than bold, I would say. But however, as the wife of the slave's owner, she probably thought she had the rights of the slave owner over this young man even though it was crossing some lines that shouldn't be crossed. She was totally infatuated with this strong, handsome, talented young man was who, who was managing the house. But while the offer was likely very tempting, Joseph was still very trustworthy, which was something new he had learned in these years of slavery. It was a loyalty to the house in which he worked, a loyalty to his master for whom he served, and a recognition of responsibility as well as, as an understanding of morality that, we, that he had now determined was important to uphold. The story says that he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the, his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. He is, uh, no one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, his wife. So how could I do this immense evil, and how could I sin against God? He stayed trustworthy in this rather tempting situation. Now, we see there's still some sense of pride in the heart of Joseph as he says, no one in this house is greater than I am. He's still a young man serving in foreigner's house as a servant. But it's also surrounded by his sense of morality and this greater loyalty to the God who had preserved him than to his Egyptian slave owner. So how could I do this immense evil and how could I sin against God? It's the first time we ever hear of Joseph considering that his actions might, might be conceived as sin against God. Well, Potiphar's wife was insistent. And that's part of this whole story here. Is there's this push and pull. It didn't change Joseph's resolve, though, this wasn't just a one-time offer that Joseph spurned. She kept after Joseph in the absence of her husband, Potiphar, until finally she set a trap. Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. Now, one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were there. Hmm. She grabbed him by his garment and said, sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. Well, we say good for Joseph, but it, it uh, turned into a little trouble. It may be one thing to be refused by a common servant, but to be spurred by the household manager put her in a very dangerous position. So she hid her lust with a false charge. And she couldn't afford to lose all that she had because of this Hebrew she had eyes for. So with the perfect evidence in hand for an accusation against Joseph, we read that when she saw that he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, my husband 
brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so he could sleep with me. And I screamed as loud as I could. And when he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment behind and ran outside. Well, she was fulfilling all the rules that would say, this is when you can claim rape. You have to scream when somebody comes after you. If nobody's around, if you're not heard, then it's not your fault anymore. But if you are heard, then of course you will be rescued. Well, Joseph no matter had no longer had a voice in the matter. No trial, no defense, and Joseph ends up in the king's prison. And this happens because of the lies of his master's wife. Genesis 39, 19 to 20, when his master heard the story his wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. Yet even in this prison, the record of the scripture is that God stayed with Joseph. God stayed with Joseph in order to bring Joseph into the place where God could use him in the way that he intended. But it still would take some more training of Joseph's characters. The scripture records, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. Now that's a very good thing because prisons in those days, of course, were not healthy places to be. The good news is he was in the place where the king's prisoners were kept, so perhaps they had a little better situation. But at any rate, it was the kind of situation where Joseph could be recognized by the warden of the prison. So um, even in that situation, with the charge against him that involved his master's own wife, Joseph found favor with the warden, and God helped Joseph put his talents to work once more. And this time, it wasn't in the household. This time, it was in the prison. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything he did successful. The continued story of Joseph's success. Well, in the meantime, we, we read in the next part of the story in Genesis chapter 40 that Pharaoh's officers get canned for something they offended the Pharaoh with. And Joseph serves them. It says in verse 2 to 4 that Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guards in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guards assigned Joseph to them as their personal attendant, and they were in custody for some time. It's interesting the language changes here just a little bit. It's no longer the prison warden, it's the captain of the guards, and it seems to me that that was a title given to Potiphar earlier in the story. So whether these two streams have a little bit different story or, or sense of who this Egyptian was as the slave over owner, or whether this is just a convenient way to use the Pharaoh's name, or the warden's name, isn't quite clear. But at any rate, we know that God is with Joseph. We know that the captain, or the warden saw favor in him, and we see here that the captain of the guard assigned Joseph to these prisoners as their, uh, to serve them while they were in custody. And the verse says that they were in custody for some time. See, none of this happens overnight, but God gave Joseph the clarity, to, the talent that is to clarify others' dreams. In all of this process, through all of these years, through all of these days, in his prayers, in the interpretation of 
Joseph's own dreams in his own heart and mind, he now had the ability to interpret others. And that's when we get to the sad stories of Pharaoh's servants. These happen in their dreams, and these happen in the interpretations. In Genesis 45, verses 4, Genesis chapter 40, verses 5 and 6. The king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. And when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. Uh, they didn't feel very good about these dreams. Dreams were considered bad omens to almost everyone in Egypt when they seemed to uh, present a future that they were unsure of. And so Joseph, having uh, care over them, being close to them, he offers to interpret their dreams. Uh, hearing that these dreams had upset them, Joseph knew that he perhaps could give them a little bit of understanding. In verses seven and eight, he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house. So we're back to the master's house there. So jail, master's house, captain of the guards, it sort of flows all together. At any rate, Joseph's still in training. Why do you look so sad today? We had dreams, they said to him, but there's no one to interpret them. Well, then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Now, he used the generic word God there. He was speaking to Egyptians who didn't know the name of Yahweh God. And uh, then he said, tell me your dreams. So first we have the cupbearer's dream. The cupbearer's dream uh, sounds like it's uh, going to be, well, maybe something good, something bad, but they, he does not know. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out, and its cluster ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hands. Well, of course, this is the kind of thing. Um, I'm not quite so... Uh, visually, not quite so literally, that the chief cupbearer was responsible for in his job before. He was responsible to make sure that there wasn't poison in the cup, make sure that this would be good, and bring it to the pharaoh. Well, in the interpretation that Joseph gave, we find out that there is good news for the cupbearer, and that's uh, that kind of uh, brings some hope maybe to the baker. This is the interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. Well, that, hearing that good news coming out of the cupbearer's dream, um, then... Uh, Joseph made a plea to him for a positive review. But when all goes well for you, he says, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. Well, Certainly, he agreed to that as he considered his next days. But now we hear the baker's dream. And this, this is something that you see right away. There was hope in the baker's heart right now. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Well, this turned out to be bad news for the baker. And as Joseph led, brought the interpretation, it was not good news. This is the interpretation, Joseph replied. 
the three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. Okay, so far, got the positive words. From off you, <laughs> it says, and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh of your body. Well, not the, this wasn't working out just exactly the way he wanted this to work out. But we find out that the interpretations are true. And in these true interpretations, on the third day, we read this in Genesis verse 40, 20 to 22, which was Pharaoh's birthday. He gave a feast for all his servants, and he elevated the chief cupbearer and the chief baker among his servants, brought them out of the prison. In other words, Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, just like the dream said. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had explained to them. Well, this should have turned into something positive to Joseph because the person right there where the Pharaoh was, who perhaps had the ear of the Pharaohs, perhaps could give a word for the Pharaoh, just didn't follow through with remembering Joseph to the Pharaoh. And Joseph's hopes are dashed because the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Well, that's where our story ends for today. Joseph again, forgotten and in the prison. And what I want, to, want you to take away from this shows up here. God allows life's challenges to clarify Joseph's character. He started out as this headstrong 17-year-old who had to be brought down into a place of humility so that he would be willing to learn the things that God had for him. And this went uh, the, the big long story for Joseph. It turned into uh, being stripped of his authority, his robe of authority by his brothers, being uh, left for dead, according to his fathers, where there'd be no rescue mission for him, being carried off to slavery in Egypt, wondering just how long he would be able to live under this situation. Then finding favor in Potiphar's house, learning to be a manager of Potiphar's goods and lands and everything else. And even though he was acting in a trustworthy way, his pride still needed some adjustment adjustment and his character still needed its clarification and he ended up in prison on a false charge but in all of this joseph was beginning to be used for the purpose of helping others that's what he was doing in potiphar's house until he was uh in prison that's what he's doing in the prison until he was now forgotten once again that's how he interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and the bread maker. And that would later lead to his elevation in the eyes of Pharaoh. But for now, it was, it was still on hold. Now, God allows life's challenges to clarify our characters in the same way. And that's the lesson I want you to take from this. Sometimes it seems like things are going on, going along real well. Sometimes we believe that our, our futures are in our own hands. Sometimes we think that everything we do is going to turn out perfectly and nothing will ever get in the way. We have plans, we have resources, we have our ideas of how tomorrow should work and next year should work. We have all of these ideas and ideals, but sometimes our character needs to be reformed and remade and renewed so that God can use us for God's purposes. And remember, God's purpose, purposes are always perfect. They're not typically the things that we expect out of life. Instead, it's the things God plans for our lives. Just think of those things that Joseph went through and then reflect on your own life. What are some of those things that you have gone through? Bobby and I office, often talk together about how God has used the challenges of our life to make us useful for others in the present of our life. And that happens when we're meeting strangers, it happens with our neighbors, it happens in church, it happens all over the place. 
And it happens for each of you if you'll pay attention and open your hearts to what God is doing in your lives and how he wants to use you for his purposes. Through all of these challenges and all of these things, you've learned some things that you learn new because you're placed in a different position. You're given two opportunities. Some, some things happen so that you can uh, be reset in your life. And sometimes you're still in that time where you don't know how God is going to make this work out. But be assured, God has your future in his hands. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you do for us more than we can do for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that as we, as we put ourselves in your hands, we can find ourselves being made into a people, into persons who can be truly used by you. Father, in our lives, in our days, in our service to others and service to you, might we discover those better purposes you have for our lives. Might we be used for you? And Lord, might we, through the challenges that we face, be humbled enough to confess to you our sin, to seek your forgiveness, to ask for your renewal in our lives. And Father, we trust in you to be the remaker of our character so that we might be reformers for your world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.